Okay. Uh, so that's it's actually ale ward Watton. <laughs> <laughs> so hyphenated. Um, I used to be Kimpton but got married last year and everybody's really struggling with um, the name so sorry but that's what it is. Um, so as Graham said I've been doing some work. I'm now Cornwall Partnership Trust because I don't know if any of you are like me but I think I've been in five organisations in the last um, five years, six years but I haven't actually changed my job. It just keeps going on and on and on. Um, so I'm doing um, some work with Bridie Kent, who's a professor at Plymouth University, um, and just wanted to share from a practical point of view what we've been doing um, and what effect it's had, really. Um, so Cornwall, this is me right down here. Um, beautiful scenery, and I, the best part of my working week is actually going out and seeing patients because I do see that um, view on a regular basis, which is lovely. Um, we have a higher than average elderly population, um, 525,000, um, and a high number of pressure ulcers developing in our community hospitals um, and out in the community. Um, what would be really great today is if you ask me questions as we go through rather than just listening to me, because I'm sure you'll get bored by the end. Um, so please do ask me at any point if I'm not making anything clear. Um, so in terms of our category three and four pressure ulcers, we were developing 14 and that's gone down to five to seven and is now down to one to two a month, which as I'm sure you appreciate when most of the patients are actually cared for in the community in their own homes, um, we've come a long way, still a long way to go. Um, and as many of you are aware, um, all of those grade three and four pressure ulcers have to be investigated. Um, and as we've investigated, what we were finding was that district nurses, um, residential homes, nursing homes, were classing a lot of these patients as being non-concordant. Um, and also reporting a high number of patients that were spending 24 hours in the chair. So they were sitting in the chair all day and sleeping in the chair all day. Um, so as Graham said, we met um, a little while ago um, and we developed a pressure ulcer prevention group and we looked at all the things that I'm sure most of you have looked at in terms of the tools you can use, skin bundles, um, all the turn charts, the clocks, all of these things, the PDSA cycles, everything, that skin bundles that you do, identification of red flags, um, checklists, use of frailty scale, uh, pressure ulcer leaflets, district nurses start taking out repose equipment in their cars so they've got it um, in the back of their boots and they can just blow it up when they need it. Education, we now have made sure that all our pressure ulcer training is mandatory for every single um, clinical member of staff who has to face to face contact, so on induction, um, and they have to um, do it when they're a member of staff as well. The only people we haven't managed to get there yet are the GPs, but I'm working on that one. Um, we did pathways, and we still weren't there. Um, so, wanted to look at what else, um, and so Graham approached me and wanted to, what I wanted to do was have a look and see from a clinical angle where we could use it and what we could use it for. So decided to look at the community hospitals because that was a real concern to me um, in terms of if you're providing 24 hour care, why aren't we reducing those number of pressure ulcers? So we wanted to know whether um, it reduced, the pressure monitor was able to reduce pressure ulcers. We wanted to know whether it facilitated decision making, not only for the nurses, but also for the patient as well. Um, and what positions that we were able to avoid um, to prevent those pressure ulcers. We wanted to know if it was compatible with healing um, and whether it was acceptable and comfortable to the patient, because obviously they're on a dynamic mattress potentially anyway, and then you've got another piece of kit as well. So did the patient actually like it? Um, and these are just some of the, the images that we used um, and we've managed to get from the analyzer. And as Graham said, when you look at it, you've got these areas that the patient um, is not sitting on the mattress. And what we did was actually looked at the different mattresses that are available um, with regards to um, the monitor um, and the ward. What was interesting was because it was a community hospital was the length of time that people weren't on the bed. 
Um, and it was a rehabilitation hospital, it was community hospital, so that's what they went there for. Um, what we were able to do was use this with the physios and OTs to demonstrate to them how long people actually weren't on pressure relieving equipment effectively, so to make sure they took their cushions with them when they went for their rehabilitation and potentially were sitting there for hours waiting to be seen. Um, so we were able to demonstrate that um, and also use the, um, the images. And I, what I do is I take these back to the ward and I show them exactly what's going on on the ward so that they can see um, what's happening. And what I wanted to look at was, is there actually a difference between the mattresses we use? Is there a difference between the foam mattress, the hybrid mattress, the overlay mattress, the dynamic mattress? Because when you look at it, there's actually very little research out there that says one mattress is better than another. Um, and what started to come apparent was also how shape started to influence patients and um, how they were showing images actually on the monitors. And there's been some research, only one piece of research I can find um, that's actually looked at shape as a risk assessment tool. And they've looked at the apple, the, um, the, the pear. Um, I didn't like to put myself in one of those. Um, but, and it's actually very hard to start judging a patient. But it is very obvious when you start looking at patients that people who are apple shape have all their weight in their trunk. Um, and that's what this particular patient is. If you can see how the area here, sorry, I'm left-handed, um, the area here, how much of an area that is actually um, corresponding with the monitor. This was um, a deep cell dynamic replacement. And you can see with this particular one, this patient is laying flat. And so a lot more of the mattress is covered compared to the other um, picture, which is why you've got such a good um, picture um, and the rates are really good and these rates when you talk about the 32 millimeters of mercury um, and potentially there has been some research that that's when it could start these rates are going down to 20 you know which are millimeters of mercury which are, are really amazing for people to get that level um, and this was looking at and being able to show and demonstrate to the nurses the different positions that their patients are getting in and what effect that has on the actual pressure. So using it very much as an educational tool. So this patient had their legs bent, but they weren't using the knee brake. So because of that, you can see that they've got a high pressure, still not massively high. It's in the um, it's sort of 87, um, but it's still in that sacral area. And a lot of pressure ulcers we're getting are actually sacral pressure ulcers, and it's because they're sacral sitting. Um, and this can demonstrate that very clearly as well. Um, and this was a high risk foam mattress of a patient lying on the side and it was just being able to demonstrate to nurses that using the 30 degree tilt, although there's a lot of research out there to say that the 30 degree tilt is much better, to be able to demonstrate the effect of somebody laying completely on their side, on their hip and on their shoulder and what effect that has on pressure is very powerful because at the end of the day red means danger. And if you can demonstrate that something is red, then people automatically think, oh my God, I've got to do something about it. Um, and so this was somebody on a foam mattress right on their side with their knees bent. And you can see here that the pressures are going up to 140 at this point. And if they stay on that area for, you know, anything a half an hour, an hour, two hours, then that's going to have a major effect of the development of pressure ulcers. And when you think how many pressure ulcers are actually developing on hips, that's going to be why, and you can demonstrate that very clearly. Um, <coughs> and again, this was um, a patient who had no support um, with their um, knees bent, and you can see the heel, the effect that that's having on the heel, and we're up to 187 at that point. So when you've got a high risk of heel pressure ulcers developing in some community hospitals or out in the community, then that's very clearly able to demonstrate why that's happening. Um, and again, not, being, not using the, um, the backrest, which quite a few of my patients, particularly in the community, are doing, is that they're not necessarily using a backrest or they're on their own bed without a backrest, then the pressure that that's putting because they've got no support to actually lie back into. 
um, and just being able to demonstrate here that you know just so that you can act people when they look at pressure damage they're looking at hips they look at sacrum they look at heels very rarely do people actually go down the spine and look at the spine so to be able to demonstrate that that is a high risk area for this patient um, and that that's an area and this would be an area that as Graham demonstrated a, a circle would come up so it would give you that indication that that's where you need to look. Um, and then I wanted to look at the hybrid mattress because the hybrid mattress is something that I'm sure you've all seen it's the new thing on the market is it any better than an ordinary foam mattress well if you think back to the pictures I was showing you before actually no in this particular instance this hybrid mattress that we used um, wasn't giving any better pressure relief than the ordinary foam mattress so and this is only one instance but it is something we're looking at and I think it's just, I think we can get wound up and caught up in new technology and things that are going on and before we haven't had the technology to be able to say whether it's actually working or not and whether we're spending our money on it. And this lady who was on the hybrid, she was actually, and this is when uh, looking at shape, she was a very cylindrical shape. So she was a very tall, very slender lady um, who was very mobile on the bed, actually, but had lost a huge amount of weight because she had a um, brain tumour. Um, and I just wanted to see, because she was on an ordinary foam mattress and she was starting to mark, I wanted to see whether it would make any other difference for her. I wanted to know if the mattress was comfortable for her um, and whether she found it useful. She found it good to move, which one of the problems with dynamics is that patients potentially can't move. So she found it easy to move. But as you can see, when she laid on the side, because most of us do go into almost the fetal position don't you when you go to bed I do anyway go right on my side um, and you can see that it's really high pressures now luckily she was very mobile um, so she did move but if she was somebody who didn't move overnight she was getting pressures of 210 so if she hadn't moved then by the morning she would definitely have um, some damage there um, and this again was her on the hybrid mattress um, and again you know from the sacral area it's still showing quite a, a high area so which is why I started getting concerned um, about the hybrid um, and I think um, the other thing that from this point of view as well that I was able to raise was um, with regards to the teams was looking at the length of time that they're not on the bed and when you're looking at that from a dynamic point of view, a dynamic point, mattress point of view, if that's costing, you know, that's costing a huge amount of money, if somebody can be out on an ordinary foam cushion, which this person was, but be on a dynamic mattress, do you need the dynamic mattress? So it's making people look at that and realising how, how long people are actually sat out for. Um, and this was what I wanted to demonstrate here was looking at the different mattresses. So you've got a visco, a foam mattress um, and a hybrid mattress and looking at the peak pressure and the average pressure. And when you're looking at the peak pressure over the sacral area, actually some of the mattresses that the claims are that we're getting much better pressures were not. Um, and also when you start looking overlays compared to replacement, and I know this patient is a completely different patient, but in terms of what the, some of the work I've done is showing that we've managed to reduce our high risk dynamics because we're getting really good pressures with our low risk dynamics um, because dependent on the shape of the patient as well. So it's not always um, uh, the, the mattress doesn't always have to be such a high risk mattress. Um, and this is what I was saying with regards to this dynamic overlay. Um, this patient was on an ordinary foam mattress, which was for, you know, all of the day. And she was only laying on the dynamic mattress at night. And when she was in the bed, she was actually laid completely flat, which is going to reduce your pressures anyway. So I was able to have that education and discussion with the ward that they needed to relook at what mattresses and cushions they were using because they didn't need such high level mattresses if their patients were on an ordinary foam mattress all day and it was just able to demonstrate that um, and this was just showing you um, a patient that was on a large cell mattress she was a lady who was a, um, a double amputee 
Um, and what we found was, was that she was actually slipping in between the cell. She had a really tiny bottom and she was slipping in between the large cell. Um, and you can see that um, by, as she's moving over the period or staying, and she's only moving slightly, but as the bed is put up or down, they can't actually find a place that removes that red area um, completely which is when we started realising that we had major issues with some of the dynamics we were using, that they weren't necessarily fit for purpose, although they're very good, very high risk mattresses. Um, but, and I think this to me demonstrate the value of the monitoring as opposed to mapping, because every patient is different and probably 80% of the patients do are okay on the mattresses we've got, but there's that 20% that aren't. And what this has enabled me to do is look at what that 20% is and be able to make it far more patient-centered so it's more suitable for that patient and we can find the mattress for the patient. And we put her on a small cell mattress and although we haven't eliminated the red, what we did do was reduce it significantly um, and she didn't develop pressure damage um, while she was in our community hospital. What was really interesting was that she went then went to the acute unit um, and unfortunately went back onto a large cell mattress and she did develop a grade three pressure ulcer. Um, so this was a lady who um, was in their own home um, and she was very contracted she had rheumatoid arthritis she wasn't able to use her arms at all um, and so her husband um, got her out of bed and I'm not I'm not I don't know that this is demonstrating shear because I know that's actually very difficult to do but when you start looking at her getting out of bed because she had to shuffle to get out of bed it was definite red areas as that was happening. Um, and you can see as you go through the process of her getting out of bed, the red is just increasing each time she moves and shuffles across the bed. Um, and you can see with this one as she's getting out of the bed and she had a grade three that was undermining up her um, back, which, to, you know, which is caused by shear damage. So when you marry the two together, there is potentially a correlation um, between the two. Um, and this, I think, was probably the most shocking thing that we found on the ward, um, which it was a patient who had been um, at eight o'clock put on a bedpan and it was tablet time. It was um, time for um, meals, breakfast. And unfortunately, she was left there for 55 minutes. Um, now, um, that's possibly not unusual um, because people get called away to do things. Um, but what I was able to demonstrate to the ward was the shape of the bedpan um, and the effect that this lady, obviously supporting her own weight with her heels, um, and the pressures were up to 230. Now, what they've been able to look at is their process first thing in the morning at 8 o'clock if somebody actually wants to go to the toilet, making sure that they allocate somebody so that they're not left on it for 55 minutes because they get called away. And that's things that happen. It's just finding the process and making sure that you accommodate that process. Um, and the community hospital had a definite reduction in pressure ulcers um, while they used the monitor. Um, what is noticeable now, because we haven't, don't have enough monitors um, and we've had to take the monitor away from the ward, there, it has gone back up again. So that's what we're looking at to see whether we can purchase more so that they have them on the wards all the time, not on one particular patient, but that they can move around where they need to. Um, and sometimes you're not always prepared for what you see. This was a patient who was um, a spinal patient, had been asked to lay completely still for six months, uh, six weeks. And in order to do that, he was asked to remain in a community hospital. Um, and when I was looking back through the analyzer, found something that I wasn't quite <laughs> expecting. Um, I didn't analyze any further because I thought that was probably enough really. Um, so what we wanted to think about then was 
it was only a small study there was only a few patients but for me it put into question some of the reasons for using expensive dynamic equipment and did we need the expense that we were actually using um, images were emerging that hadn't been seen before those bedpan images i mean obviously the patient and his partner um, but the bedpan images that is quite powerful to show to nurses um, what effect that is happening um, and we then wanted to look at the next phase and the next phase for me was actually taking it properly out into the community on patients um, in their own homes where they don't have nurses they don't have anybody there um, all the time to see what was actually happening then so I bid for some money um, got some money from the regional innovation fund which allowed me to buy another monitor um, and also Burdett nursing charity as well um, so we started recruiting, um, so it was referral to um, the tissue viability team, um, over 18 living in their own home including nursing homes, high risk of developing pressure ulcers using the Rockwood Frailty Index as a screening tool because we knew GPs were using frailty, we knew that uh, phlebotomists were using frailty, we knew OTs and physios were using frailty, so it was a very common denominator to try and, and um, get them to use and frailty is based around mobility. So if we could think about something like that. Um, we wanted a patients with existing pressure damage which were deteriorating or static and also what was really interesting to me and something you've alluded to was those patients who were reluctant to use equipment or were, were refusing to use equipment and what influence it could actually have on those patients. Um, and what I wanted to look at was non-concordance and are patients non-concordant and what is the definition of non-concordant or have we just moved um, non-compliance to non-concordance and change the terminology um, and that was what I really found interesting and seeing whether the visual image was able to equalize that knowledge base between the patient and the nurse um, and, and see whether that relationship um, improved because of that. So we all want to have x-ray vision in the community, you might, or anywhere where you pressure map, you might have a patient in that position, perfect position, but actually when you leave the house, they're usually in that position. So what I wanted to know what was going on when we weren't there, basically. And you've heard um, about the sensor. Um, it stays in place for one to two days. Some patients have had it in longer um, because they've wanted it in longer. So it's just dependent on what they'll agree to. Um, we collect it electronically, as Graham said, and then I usually feed the results back. If I see something really um, alarming, we go through it at that point and try and change equipment at that point, or we try and change the position if I see loads of red marks, because from an ethical point of view, I find it really hard to walk away just to get some data um, and see what it shows. So if I need to make a decision at that point, I will change care at that point. If I'm really not sure what was going on, then it stays. And then when I go back, I download the information, I show them what's on the computer and we go through it together um, and then make a decision on a change of care, either change of equipment or just change of positioning. And I either leave it in place um, again once they've made those decisions or I go back later, depending on them. So in terms of following my research protocol, I probably don't do it as well as I should do um, because it's dependent on the patient. Um, and although I've said at four time points, this is what I'll do, um, in reality, it's what the patient will allow me to do as well. Um, so we've looked at it, the data from a quantitative analysis using the SPSS. Um, qualitatively, we're collecting questionnaires with regards to how do they find the monitor? Do they find it too bright? Do they find it too slippery? Um, has it been useful for them? Um, and we try and um, collect, we look at the baseline information as well. Um, and then when I go back um, to see in terms of what their healing rate is um, and those sorts of things and we collect the average pressure and the peak pressure in the surface area. So in terms of the regional innovation stuff that we've done, um, we've had 39 patients. As you can see, the majority um, are female. Um, sorry. And um, in terms of age group, we've actually had all age groups. 
And the reason why we've had all age groups is because we've had a lot of patients who are spinal cord injuries, who are bed bound um, and have a very, you know, a very young age. So it's not just an elderly population, um, it's all the age groups. Yeah, we've had, yeah, so um, um, we've had really low weight, really low BMIs and really high BMIs as well. And that is, what's really interesting is that is the effect that has on the equipment um, and the different weights, as I say, the different shapes as well. And they might be a normal BMI, but if all their weight is in their trunk, then that is having a completely different effect on the monitor, on the equipment than other as well um, and I think from a weight point of view the biggest problem we're finding is the really low weight patients so um, although manufacturers will tell you that their equipment goes down to six five four stone in reality when you start monitoring them it's not accommodating them um, so in terms of uh, the healing rates um, we've of the 39 patients we've had uh, 22 that have completely healed um, another six are healing, seven um, have died and they were patients who were dying anyway um, and they were end of life and what we wanted to do was we knew that their mattress wasn't fit for purpose in terms of that they were breaking down on their current equipment so we wanted to try and find if we could find a different mattress that would stop them at least the deterioration. Um, so we knew they were, um, they were going to die quite quickly, but I needed to get it in as quick as possible to try and improve um, their end of life, basically. Four, we haven't achieved um, to heal yet or healing, and we're still looking at those. Two of those are in um, nursing homes, and some of that is restriction on equipment and getting equipment to them in a timely manner, funding for equipment, changing equipment, um, those sorts of things. So one has got osteomyelitis, um, which we're trying to treat as well. Um, so, you know, the four patients we are still looking at, the other patient lives at home, sleeps in his chair. Um, he has uh, got cardiac problems. Um, I've actually got a picture of him, uh, of his um, pressure ulcer later, just to um, go not. over. When yes. you say chair, does the, the whole system then line the chair? Do you, do you um, the chair or do you just have a... No, I have a smaller one as yeah, well. Um, yeah, I have a smaller one as well, So, which um, I managed to get for some further work um, that I'm doing as well. So I've been looking at the 24-hour picture as opposed to just the bed. <coughs> Um, so in terms of the, it's quite a busy slide, but in terms of the peak pressures before and after, what I just wanted to demonstrate was that some of the dramatic differences in pressures that have been achieved um, and the changes. So, um, you know, the blue is the pressures before and then the orange is the pressures afterwards. So some have been quite significant pressures. Some we haven't managed to change the pressures, but they've changed their behaviour. So because they've changed their behaviour, um, they've managed to still heal. Um, and we've had patients that have sat out on pressure ulcers, grade threes, for 12 hours, and they've still healed. So we haven't removed that pressure completely. Um, we haven't taken, we haven't offloaded them from that pressure and they've still healed because we've managed to reduce their pressures within the chair or the bed. Um, so this is um, a patient who that is one of the statics that I haven't been successful with, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, and he, this was when he was, we put the monitor on initially. Um, and as you can see, it was quite a good picture. Um, what was really interesting is that he spends actually most of his time sitting on the edge of his chair because he finds it more e easier to eat because he's very breathless. Um, so he sits forward all the time. And also, although he's very disabled and his mobility is very reduced, he spends an awful lot of time in his workshop on a perching stool doing his craft stuff. So we haven't quite got there with him. And this is his pressure ulcer, which unfortunately was diagnosed as a pyenoidal sinus for two years before they actually called us in. Um, we have improved things, but it's definitely not there yet. We um, upgraded his cushion. Um, we, he was classed as non-concordant by the district nurses because he wouldn't sleep in bed, he wouldn't go up to bed. Um, and so when we showed him these pictures, 
and how hard this, you know, what level of redness this was and the pressures, he said, OK, I'll go to bed. If that's what you want me to do, I'll go to bed and we'll see what happens. So this was him in, a di um, in his bed, in a dynamic replacement. What was really interesting was that actually we made his life worse um, because, as you can see, as he's trying to get out of bed, his pressures are really high. Because he has to sleep sitting up, his pressures are really high and when I went to see him and his wife his wife was in tears because she was now having to get up three or four times a night to help him to the toilet whereas previously sleeping in the chair he'd managed himself so their social life had completely changed and to me that's the most dramatic thing that this piece of equipment has done for me is looked at real patient-centered care and it's looked at what we can do to improve patient care and that the equipment suits their lifestyle rather than getting them to suit the equipment. And it has had that dramatic effect. He's now sleeping in the chair again. He's got a happy family life. His wife isn't crying anymore. He was in an Acora riser recliner chair um, just because that's how, and yeah, not recommended, not the best thing. Um, lots of people but unfortunately and i'm sure it's the same everywhere lots of people are sleeping in riser recliner chairs um, and what we need to do is make sure that the cushions within them accommodate that um, and we've changed things for him but i've got to go back and see him because we're still not there yet and he's still not healed um, so this girl um, or young lady she is a lady who lunches she's a very disabled lady um, who has some um, learning difficulties and she loves going to Zumba in her wheelchair um, she loves going out and spending her dad's money um, and she loves um, going and doing lunches and she was seen as non-concordant because she wouldn't become bed bound um, and that's not what she wanted to do she wanted to continue with her Zumbering um, so we looked at her looked at the cushion and as you can see she was leaning over to one side and this is the IT area um, and we changed the pressures and we had a significant reduction in peak pressures. And what had happened was they had overinflated the Roho, but also they had, um, they had um, a pummel in the middle and they hadn't um, done it right so that she wasn't equally distributed on the cushion either. So we were able to look at that um, and, in, and improve that. And with... Um, negative pressure and um, she was also on a dynamic um, replacement mattress but didn't want to stay on it she had agreed to go on it um, but she didn't want to stay on it because she got really cold she was a very thin lady and her feet got really cold and she used to get chill blains in the winter so what she wanted to do was use an electric blanket. and every company I asked um, for dynamic equipment wouldn't allow an electric blanket to go on their mattress um, so we changed um, her mattress um, because when we started looking at her on that side because she had a fused back because of some work she had done as a child she was okay but when she was on the other side she had a really high um, mark on that hip and although she had a very prominent hip bone she hadn't broken into a pressure ulcer I really didn't want her to and because it was um, 256 I felt I needed to do something so we changed it and although we haven't got rid of it completely we have reduced the pressures to 119 so and she has turned overnight as well but at least we've managed to reduce the pressures um, and this is a guy who's had five different mattresses um, and we keep going and the problem for him was that he couldn't sleep because all the although the pressures weren't particularly high um, higher than i would like they were, as these cells were inflating, they were actually pressing into his back um, and into his sacral area. And it was his sacral area that was really quite red um, and edging towards a deep tissue. So um, we changed his mattress um, and got um, reduced pressures. He was sinking much better into the mattress and he sleeps in a semi-prone position. Um, and the biggest thing for him is that he sleeps now and that was the most significant thing for him. And he's actually on my focus group. And he said, you have no idea how good it is to sleep. 
Um, so the, the impact it's having on patients is, is dramatic. And what he says is, why do you, why do you come around and see somebody? He came from, from the spinal cord unit and was given a mattress. You're guessing, he said to me. Every time you put a mattress under somebody, you're guessing whether that mattress will work for that patient. But actually, I know this will ma work for me. And he won't try another mattress unless we monitor him first. Um, and this um, patient was somebody who was, would not have a mattress at all, wouldn't have anything in his house, wouldn't have anything that wasn't bought brand new um, because his wife um, was a bit OCD, had to be brand new, never been under any other patient at all um, and was in a double bed, couldn't go in a single bed. So I put an overlay on one side of his single bed um, and they watched it as it inflated and what they saw were the different colours and as the colours changed um, they could see that it was going to have a dramatic effect. He actually had a grade three on his back which healed and now they won't let me take it out. Um, so just really dramatic effects with some patients. <laughs> Uh, and what I wanted to demonstrate was it's not always high cost equipment so this person is um, on a dynamic mattress, high risk dynamic mattress and you can see the high levels here in the sacral area um, which actually developed this pressure ulcer which had the potential to become a deep tissue um, and we put on a blow up repose cushion and because she was laying down in bed and just wanted to be in the double bed next to her husband that healed to a grade two and didn't go down to a deep tissue injury and you can see the difference in the pictures in terms of the sacral area because she wasn't in the s sitting position because um, she wanted to lie down and she wanted to lie down next to her husband so a difference probably when you're looking at that of about 1500 pounds for that one patient um, and this lady as well um, I think for, in terms of what was really interesting with this patient was that she was being looked after by her two sons who ran a farm um, and they believed everybody should be treated like their cows really so um, what they wanted to put on the wound was exactly what they would put on the saw on a cow um, so it was quite a difficult situation um, and they kept giving us stuff and feeding us stuff not quite what they were feeding the cows but basically that's you know how she was being cared for and looked after um, and although we talked to them about not sitting um, the patient up because we knew it was causing a problem and we couldn't quite get that over to them so we left the monitor in place and they kept telling us that they weren't sitting her up we're not sitting her up at all um, but actually when we fed it back and looked at it you could see very clearly yes they were but that's what they needed to do and she was very chesty so that's what they wanted to do so you could argue is, are they being non-concordant or are, are they actually trying to provide the best care they can for their mum so that she doesn't get a chest infection and she's comfortable so what we did was we changed the mattress and we managed to find um, the mattress that accommodated her and allowed her to sleep in the sitting position so that she um, reduced her chances of chest infection she died but she died comfortably which was really important um, and again this lady was very reluctant to and I only saw her last week um, very reluctant to have equipment the equipment we'd put in thinking that we'd done what we should do because we actually used the prelude cushion um, and this was the picture from the prelude cushion so district nurses had put something in thinking actually we've solved the problem um, and then when we monitored her I thought oh no we haven't um, but the difficulty for me is being in the community is that I don't always have the cushion with me that I want um, and again this was the mattress that she was on and I rented in another mattress that night but I wasn't able to provide um, another cushion but which is is really hard to take so can pressure ulcers be um, reduced following the use of the monitor? 87.5% of patients where change of equipment is complete, the pressure ulcers improved or healed following the use of the pressure monitor. Um, 
100% of patients and relatives have agreed to changes. So all those patients that were not agreeing to anything, no equipment, 100% of them have agreed to changes because of what they've seen on the pressure monitor. Um, can it identify positions which are not compatible? Um, 94 of the patients had to have equipment or positions changed, 94%, because they weren't compatible with healing. Um, is it acceptable and comfortable? Most patients say it's easy to use. Most of them say there's no issues, nothing to worry about. Some do find it a little bit slippery and some have found the monitor too bright. And when that's happened, I've tended to put it underneath the bed um, and I've had a, a, a patient who's been on um, one of those beds, can't remember what they're called, that has the little drawers underneath that you, the divan beds and we've even shoved it in there just so that we can um, get a picture to see what's going on and then I've relayed it back to them because they weren't going to be able to change overnight anyway um, so there was no benefit to them to see what was on the monitor. Um, patients have said why haven't we had this before it's amazing when can we buy one um, so it wasn't my fault and that's what a patient said to me because he couldn't go up to bed because he had no ability to get up the stairs the council wouldn't allow him to build an extension he thought it was his fault because he was classed as non-concordant so when I was able to show him the picture on the monitor that actually it was the chair causing the problem and we were able to alleviate that pressure he said so it's not my fault then which was really significant so can monitoring influence non-concordant patients well, I think the figures speak for themselves for me. Um, and we've also reduced our costings because we haven't bought a high risk pressure relieving mattress for use in the community for 18 months. Um, we're using mainly um, lower risk mattresses um, and we're changing as much as possible over to um, non-powered as well, but can't in all cases, but we're not spending the same amount. We're recycling what we've got rather than having to buy new. I believe it reduces community acquired pressure ulcers, I believe it reduces hospital admissions and can reduce community nursing visits, um, it definitely enhances the quality of life for patients and their carers and it does identify potential reasons for non-concordance because it's usually because the equipment is uncomfortable rather than um, anything else or it's not fit for purpose for them. Um, and just want to demonstrate a picture of me that somebody took trying to take lots of mattresses and cushions in my little mini that I treated myself to um, and say this is a cushion this is a mattress this is a cushion this is a cushion and that's my attempt at being sporty with my jacket over the top um, so there are challenges and don't get me wrong there are definite challenges with regards to um, this work um, trying different equipment in the community is a nightmare because trying to get it there and change it over and in a timely manner and not having to wait for it to be delivered, all of those things is not easy. The length of time it's taking to get it right for some patients is over and over and over again. Um, leaving the monitor in the patient's home is quite hard to do because it is an expensive piece of equipment, um, but it is insured. So, <laughs> um, you know, and it, it is very difficult walking away from it. Um, the geography of Cornwall is a nightmare um, because it's such a wide area so I could be in Penzance one day, um, I could be on the Isles of Scilly on one day and I could be in Bude or Salt Ash which is near Plymouth another so which can take me three hours to get from one end to the other um, and people have become dependency, dependent on the technology. Some patients won't change anything without using the monitor. And I have to say, I've become dependent on the technology. Um, and I would fight anybody to take it away from me um, because I know what a difference it's had. It's had such a major impact. Um, and Regional Innovation Fund, as I said, has helped the Burdett has helped Sumed have helped me and I've just um, the end of last year beginning of this I also won a health foundation bid um, to continue more work um, with regards to it that's it thank you